you. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen, Your Excellency. Yes, once again, greetings, Your Excellency, in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, today, Your Excellencies, we will hear presentations on the topic civil and customary marriages is one more important than the other. A very interesting topic indeed. Like you said, Your Excellency, we are here to learn and to hear from their excellencies as this topic has been revealed uh, to them as they share to our, with us uh, here in this evening, I mean, this afternoon. We are going to be hearing from, call them regions, but I will say continents, the continent of Africa and Europe. We're hearing from great men and women of God, from France, from Kenya, from the Republic of South Africa, from Angola. Your Excellencies, we are quite honored to have you share what you have to share with us on this very important uh, topic. But before we go further to hear from their excellencies, can I at this juncture call upon the technical team to help us uh, play the GBR video for the benefit of all that may not be so familiar with what GBR is about. Technical team, please, can share with us that video. Thank you. The Global Business Roundtable has a God-given mission to focus on the holistic development of people in line with God's plan for His Kingdom. The aim of the organization is to help members to grow spiritually, intellectually, to grow their networks and to participate in trade and investment opportunities, to also participate in mentorship and coaching programs and to expand their businesses. Our organization focuses on the holistic development of its members and invests its time and resources in developing people in key sectors, including spiritual growth and development, which is critical to ensure and to foster strong moral values and, uh, and ethics, which we want to inculcate in all our leaders and standards so that we could contribute to the uh, production of a new breed of leaders that will shape and transform Africa and the rest of the world. Since its launch in Johannesburg, South Africa in 2009, the Global Business Roundtable has impacted thousands of lives around the world. Ten years after its launch, this God-focused organization has a presence in more than 80 countries in the following regions. The Southern African Development Community, East Africa, West Africa, Central Africa, North Africa, Asia, Europe, North America, South America, and the Caribbean. GBR has strategic initiatives, programs, and platforms that facilitate growth and opportunities for its members. This is done through the global and local events such as World Congress, Prayer Camp, and the Thought Leaders Summit, Women of Character Summit, Future Leaders Summit, Trade and Investment Exhibitions, and GBR Sessions. These events create an environment for our members and partners to meet, interact, and create relationships that will develop their businesses and lives holistically. GBR also has a TV show called A New Thing, which seeks to educate, inform, challenge, empower, and inspire one to live their best lives in line with God's purpose by bringing in several experts from various fields and sectors together. The Global Business Roundtable believes that informed and engaged leaders can make a positive change in the world. The GBR Academy was established primarily to address leadership capacity within the Global Business Roundtable leadership structures. The GBR platform is an online system that exists to create opportunities for personal and professional development. It is poised to further facilitate trade and investment opportunities across nations and industries for big business. For more information on our organization, please visit www.globalbusinessroundtable.com or contact us on plus 2711-242-8000. Thank you very much, technical team. 
we are blessed to have you here. This way then we get to be more or less on the same page in terms of what GBR is about. We would like to thank you all, your excellencies, for attending this very important session. We are going to call upon my brother here, His Excellency, but my brother, do forgive me if I murder your, your name in terms of pronunciation. Um, Mr. Khelvais, um, from France, uh, originally from the Congo, Khelvais Loembe has a rich dual cultural heritage. He started his career as a professor of physical sciences and astronomy at St. Charles in Orleans in the Paris uh, region. He has been involved and has experience in the following areas, scientific reporter at Radio France International, carrying out missions for UNESCO, founded the Association for the Aid of Educational and Cultural Equipment in Orleans, president of the Lions Club, or even actor in the French uh, speaking world. Kavaz is an author of Palon's Ville, a work of anthropology and Bantu tales written in French. As a delegate of the prefect of Centre Val de Louis region, or Lore region, Havais received the insignia of Knight of the Legion of Owner. <clears throat> he is also involved in employment creation, education, security, health, and urban renewal. My brother, we are blessed to have you. Your 15 minutes start right now, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Euh, bonjour à tous. Je pense qu'il m'est demandé à présent de prendre la parole et je vais devoir m'exprimer concernant le sujet qui nous impacte aujourd'hui. Alors, ce que je voudrais dire, c'est que vous m'excuserez, mais je m'exprimerai en, en français. Euh, J'espère et je pense qu'il y a quelqu'un qui est en train de traduire mon propos. Le mariage civil, le mariage traditionnel. Le mariage, pour commencer, est un acte fondateur de notre société qui permet de perpétuer l'espèce humaine de façon régulée et structurée. Il n'a pas encore été identifié un rituel similaire chez les animaux, c'est-à-dire qu'on n'a pas vu des animaux mettre en place une cérémonie qui permet justement de structurer, de réguler la mise en commun de deux de êtres pour euh, euh, créer ce que l'on retrouve chez l'être humain. On pourrait donc dire que c'est une caractéristique de l'être humain que d'être à même de mettre en place cette cérémonie. Et nous verrons euh, un peu plus tard, et notamment dans les questions, à quoi cela peut bien servir. On peut cependant remarquer que, oui, on a vu chez les ovipares, c'est-à-dire les, les volatiles, cette possibilité d'avoir des œufs et à tour de rôle, ils se mettent ensemble pour les couver. Mais cela ne suffit pas. Quand on va un peu plus tard chez les grands singes, on constate que euh, nous avons également, nous avons également euh, la possibilité d'une vie en communauté de deux partenaires de sexes différents, de façon à entretenir et accompagner leur progéniture, leurs enfants. Eh bien, chez l'être humain, on voit quelque chose de totalement différent. Pour faire court, je dirais qu'il a été constaté, en tout cas, il a été mis en place un certain nombre de pratiques et de règles qui permettent de s'assurer que deux êtres vont se mettre ensemble, d'abord pour une vie en communauté qui pourrait durer longtemps, mais qui en même temps va lui permettre d'avoir une descendance et le 
but de cette mise en commun et de la, du, du suivi de cette descendance est de pouvoir assurer le, les meilleures conditions et un meilleur climat permettant euh, de s'assurer de l'épanouissement de ces enfants, aussi bien de la progéniture, c'est-à-dire des enfants qui vont être issus de ce lien, que des parents qui se sont mis ensemble pour cela. Nous avons là euh, la création, ce qu'on appelle d'un foyer, c'est-à-dire d'une unité sociale. C'est extrêmement important pour euh, la perpétuation de la race, en tout cas de l'espèce humaine, de la race humaine, race au terme biologique et scientifique du terme. Alors, euh, pour cela, nous avons donc un certain nombre de pratiques qu'on appelle, euh, on peut appeler d'ailleurs un rituel, c'est-à-dire un certain nombre d'attitudes, de, de, de comportements, de, de choses qui feront que petit à petit, on va euh, avoir ce qu'on appellera un mariage traditionnel. Euh, en notant bien que la tradition, c'est quoi si on peut faire une, euh, une définition simple la tradition sera considérée comme, l'acception serait que c'est un ensemble de règles et de pratiques que, euh, qui ont été retenues, que l'être humain ou les personnes de cette société ont retenues comme leur permettant d'avoir une vie harmonieuse et ces pratiques ont fait leur preuve. On a fait les preuves que le respect de ces règles-là permettront au fur et à mesure, à cette société, à cette communauté naissante qui s'est créée, de vivre en harmonie, en tout cas de vivre dans la paix, d'avoir une vie apaisée. C'est extrêmement important, c'est ce que la, le, le mariage traditionnel va apporter. Euh, c'est important, c'est une caractéristique importante. Alors, ce mariage traditionnel, eh bien, il va avoir ce qu'on appelle un rituel, un certain nombre de rites, qui cumulent d'ailleurs deux choses, ce qu'on appellera le rite de passage et le rite d'initiation. Le rite d'initiation, c'est quoi C'est nous allons avoir un certain nombre de pratiques qui, permettra, qui permettront, en tout cas ces pratiques, d'initier, d'informer, de former ces personnes, ces deux personnes, et qui vont changer de condition. C'est-à-dire, vous avez un jeune homme qui, pour l'instant, vivait seul, et on va lui l'emmener à prendre conscience de la nécessité de savoir traiter celui qui est en face, c'est-à-dire la femme. Mais de la même façon, la femme qui a un rôle extrêmement important dans la tradition, je vais dire africaine, va aussi être emmenée à être initiée, c'est-à-dire formée. Euh, on, chez les Congo, par exemple, chez les Vili, on trouvera une pratique initiatique qu'on appelle chikumbi. Chikumbi, c'est que on va prendre une femme, on va garder pendant trois, trois mois, six mois parfois, euh, on va dire en captivité, et pendant cette période, on va lui enseigner un certain nombre de pratiques, comment prendre soin de son corps, comment prendre soin de son enfant, et comment assurer la transmission de la tradition qui passe par la femme parce que dans un certain nombre de, de, de sociétés en Afrique, nous avons un système matrilinéaire, c'est-à-dire euh, la tradition, la transmission de la tradition et des règles passe par la femme. Donc cette femme doit être informée de son rôle et d'un certain nombre d'éléments qu'elle transmettra à ses enfants. Ne perdons pas de vue que dans la société dite occidentale ou la société moderne, nous garderons quand même ce rôle de la femme qui nous emmènera à appeler la langue que parlera la maman à ses enfants, une langue maternelle, une école maternelle. Donc, on voit bien le rôle de la maman dans l'éducation et dans le langage de l'enfant. Une fois de plus, ce ne sont pas des éléments qu'on acquiert de façon spontanée, cela s'acquiert euh, par une formation, une formation initiatique qui est différente de l'instruction en notant que dans une formation initiatique, euh, c'est une formation par immersion, c'est-à-dire on la met dans des conditions données et on, on, en fonction de sa réaction, on lui expliquera ce qu'il en est et ce que l'on veut faire. Donc nous avons bien là un rite d'initiation qui va être complété par un rite de passage, c'est-à-dire que 
euh, euh, après avoir acquis un certain nombre de choses, de savoir, eh bien, euh, la situation de ces deux personnes, aussi bien de ce jeune homme que cette jeune femme, va changer pour devenir donc euh, des hommes mariés, c'est-à-dire une cellule de la société en général, c'est un foyer, c'est-à-dire un homme une femme qui vont constituer une entité de la grande société humaine. C'est quelque chose d'extrêmement important parce que c'est le début, c'est la première cellule de la grande société humaine qui permettra d'assurer les meilleures conditions de naissance et d'épanouissement d'un être humain qui devra ensuite se perpétuer euh, de siècle en siècle et de millénaire en millénaire. Donc, on voit bien l'extrême importance de, cette, de ce mariage dit traditionnel qui va caractériser, je répète, toutes les sociétés humaines, c'est-à-dire qu'on soit en Amérique, et en Asie, en Europe et en, en Afrique, nous aurons des mariages considérés comme traditionnels parce que relevant d'une certaine tradition, tradition qui sera liée à la culture, à l'environnement de cet endroit. Alors, je pourrais revenir très rapidement d'ailleurs sur cette, cette, ce rite dit euh, traditionnel, plutôt ce rituel qui relève du mariage traditionnel. Alors, si je faisais très très court, je dirais qu'il y a au moins trois choses. Euh, la première chose, c'est qu'on aura... Euh, une entrée, plutôt un appel, c'est-à-dire on va interpeller, euh, après avoir identifié euh, la femme ou l'homme qui plaît, euh, là encore on pourrait en discuter parce que la démarche n'est pas toujours faite par euh, le, les futurs conjoints, elle est parfois faite par les parents, ça aussi il faut le savoir, c'est-à-dire il arrive souvent dans, les, dans le mariage traditionnel que les deux futurs époux ne se connaissent pas, et que ce sont les parents qui ont décidé de les mettre ensemble. Ce n'est pas pire qu'ailleurs, mais c'est aussi une possibilité. Ils peuvent se choisir, se connaître et se présenter. Et il y a aussi l'inverse, où ils ne se connaissent pas du tout et que c'est les parents qui ont décidé. Donc, il y a cette première démarche qui consiste à euh, se présenter. On appelle ça le co co, -co c'est-à-dire on vient frapper à la porte d'une famille pour dire, euh, écoutez, nous avons des choses à vous dire. Ça, c'est la première étape. Une deuxième étape qui consiste, alors la réponse elle est envoyée sous une forme ou sous une autre, hein, euh, et il y a la deuxième étape, une invitation est faite à cette famille pour leur dire, bah, écoutez, puisque vous avez des choses à nous dire, il nous semble que c'est pour les raisons que nous soupçonnons, c'est-à-dire euh, peut-être une, une liaison, un mariage, euh, si tel est le cas, venez donc tel jour à telle heure euh, en famille et nous en parlerons. Donc là, nous sommes à la deuxième étape, qui est l'étape d'entrée. Donc, la famille qui a, a souhaité être reçue pour exprimer son besoin vient et le dit à la famille de la femme, généralement, qui va l'écouter. Sur ce, on leur donnera une liste en leur disant, voilà, écoutez, puisque c'est pour un lien, pour un mariage, euh, nous ne sommes pas contre, mais voilà éventuellement les conditions. Alors on leur donne des conditions, et dans ces conditions, il y a une liste de, de choses symboliques qui tantôt peut être une bouteille de rhum, une bouteille de vin de palme, une dame jeanne, c'est-à-dire 10 litres de vin de palme, euh, un, une, de, une étoffe, euh, un costume pour le père, une, euh, une paire de chaussures, un, un montant symbolique. Euh, tout ceci est, consu, est consigné sur, euh, dans une liste et remis à la famille. Ils vont aller discuter, ils se mettront d'accord et à ce moment-là, fixeront la date où ils viendront. Donc, nous passons donc là à la troisième étape. Et à cette troisième étape, pour faire court, eh bien, les deux familles, donc la famille euh, de, du garçon, du jeune homme, viendra euh, avec la liste de ce qu'on lui a demandé et la famille de la future épouse euh, attendra cette visite sur un jour qui a été déterminé, dans un lieu qui a été déterminé également. Il est bien entendu qu'on prendra le temps de faire une certaine préparation afin que les uns et les autres puissent avancer. Alors, il faut dire que nous sommes là dans un rituel. Qui dit rituel, dit 
une attitude, un comportement et des actes posés qui sont totalement codifiés. On ne fait pas n'importe quoi. Quand c'est un costume qui est demandé, ce n'est pas cinq costumes qui sont demandés. Quand il est demandé une pièce, c'est-à-dire une certaine longueur, de, de, un certain nombre de yards de tissu, ce sont ces tissus-là, pas d'autres. Si c'est du raffia qui est demandé, donc tout cela est très codifié et est très symbolique. Bien, donc une liste est donnée. À cette liste-là, les gens s'organisent pour répondre à cela. Une date est prise et les deux familles se rencontrent généralement dans la famille de la femme et plus précisément chez l'oncle maternel de la femme. Donc, ces personnes vont se retrouver. Deuxième chose extrêmement importante, ce sont les deux familles, d'abord. Euh, en général, ce n'est pas le père et la mère, donc les deux familles, c'est au-delà de la famille nucléaire, les tantes, les oncles, etc. Donc, on n'est jamais en dessous d'une de, vingtaine de personnes. Donc, au total, une quarantaine, vous voyez que ça fait déjà du monde. Au-delà, nous allons ensuite euh, quelque chose de très important, il faut avoir ce qu'on appelle un maître de la parole, c'est-à-dire qu'il y aura quelqu'un qui sera… Alors, l'avocat en français, ce n'est pas le bon terme, l'huissier non plus, mais c'est quelqu'un qui servira d'intermédiaire, c'est lui qui sera chargé d'exprimer l'attente, le vœu, les vœux de chaque partie et aura ce rôle également de modérateur, de temporisateur de cela. Et de, à partir de ce moment-là, la cérémonie va se dérouler, c'est-à-dire que les uns et les autres exprimeront le motif de leur présence et euh, commencera donc ce euh, rituel, donc cette façon de faire, qui peut durer entre deux heures à, à toute une journée, parce que des tractations auront lieu. Euh, on demandera à la famille de la femme de la future épouse demandera les raisons de la présence de ces personnes en simulant de, de l'ignorer et la famille de la, 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 la famille de l'homme répondra en feignant également de se savoir qu'ils avaient eu déjà les premiers contacts. Ces échanges vont se faire dans le, une sorte de jeu de rôle extrêmement intéressant, extrêmement instructif et surtout relevant de la tradition et cela de façon totalement codifiée puisqu'il y a un porte-parole qui est là, qui exprime les choses comme il faut et à aucun moment le futur marié ou d'abord le futur marié ne parlera il ne parlera jamais, il ne parle pas et la future épouse n'est pas présente ensuite a lieu donc euh, le déroulement de cela les échanges, la liste est demandée on présentera les éléments et euh, après la présentation des éléments, en général, s'ensuit une espèce de joute oratoire parce que tout n'est jamais parfaitement respecté et la moindre euh, raison est bonne pour contester la possibilité que les choses se poursuivent. Mais euh, reconnaissance est généralement un jeu de rôle, qui, un jeu de rôle euh, qui permet de tester les capacités oratoires de chaque partie d'abord, mais de jauger également la force et la puissance de l'autre, parce que nous sommes là dans une espèce de, 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 de comparaison, de, de tentative un peu d'intimidation, où la femme, la famille de la femme estimera que ce qui est fait n'est pas suffisant, la famille de l'homme dit qu'on exagère peut-être un peu, on est en train de pousser les uns l'un l'autre vers ces derniers retranchements, pour savoir ce qu'il a, comme on dit en français, dans le ventre, c'est-à-dire de savoir à quel point ils sont capables de retenue. Ils sont capables aussi d'exprimer de, leur volonté d'avoir cette femme, parce qu'on leur dira, bon, mais voilà, on a besoin de deux d'Amjane, certains vont trouver que c'est trop. Mais si c'est trop, ça veut dire que on estime peut-être que la femme ne vaut pas cela. Donc c'est assez, euh, assez intéressant. Et à la fin, euh, les choses rentrent dans l'ordre, après avoir contesté un certain nombre de choses, parfois on y met de la voix, il arrive même que la cérémonie est interrompue pendant un quart d'heure, une demi-heure, et, et pourquoi pas au-delà, puis ils reviennent, mais nous savons qu'à la fin, les choses rentrent dans l'ordre, la cérémonie se déroule comme attendu, c'est-à-dire l'échange, enfin, la liste est respectée, elle est donnée, 
on donne l'absolution à l'union de ces deux personnes. Et on, une des choses assez amusantes et intéressantes, c'est qu'on demande à l'homme de reconnaître la, sa dulcinée, celle qui a été choisie. Il y a un jeu de rôle qui est fait là aussi. C'est très amusant. Et quand tout cela est terminé, on les met ensemble, enfin, ils se reconnaissent l'un l'autre et le, on interroge la femme pour savoir si c'était bien l'homme. De la même façon, l'homme, la famille de l'homme, on lui demande si c'était bien la femme. On les présente les uns aux autres à la famille. Il arrive des fois que c'est lui des premières fois qu'il se voit. Et voilà. Ensuite, euh, ils vont être dépossédés de leurs vêtements, bien entendu, après qu'ils soient retirés. Et ils sont vêtus vêtis ensuite de nouveaux euh, apanages qui vont euh, caractériser leur nouvel état d'hommes ou de femmes mariées. C'est quelque chose de très important également parce que nous sommes partis là d'un rite d'initiation qui vient d'avoir lieu, à un rite de passage que nous avons vécu ensemble en termes de cérémonie. Et cette cérémonie va voir que la femme sera... Euh, va changer de vêtement, l'homme également, et ils vont démarrer leur nouvelle vie sans avoir, d'abord, mais pas sans avoir, chacun bu un verre euh, ou de l'eau ou de vin de parmi qui sera versé dans le sol pour dire ce qui est lié ici ne sera plus jamais lié. C'est extrêmement important, mais c'est extrêmement symbolique également. Alors, je, je vais faire court pour aller rejoindre quelle différence finalement euh, avec le mariage civil. Ben, euh, si on veut faire court, on peut imaginer simplement que le mariage civil est la version moderne du mariage dit traditionnel. Euh, toutes les traditions sont amenées à évoluer en fonction de son environnement, en fonction des gens qui les constituent. Nous sommes aujourd'hui dans un système qui est assez différent, on va dire, influencé par l'Occident dans sa façon de faire, c'est-à-dire que nous allons entrer dans une méthodologie où euh, euh, il s'agira de deux êtres qui vont se choisir, pas forcément avec l'assentiment des parents, euh, dans ce mariage civil. Deux, nous sommes dans une société où il y a un certain nombre de, de droits et il, le mariage va être cette forme d'union qui permettra la protection de deux êtres qui ont décidé d'avoir une vie commune, d'acquérir des biens communs, d'avoir une progéniture, et il s'agira de se donner les moyens, de, de les protéger, de s'épanouir ensemble, mais surtout en tenant compte donc de, des règles de la société. D'où ce mot qui devient un mariage civil euh, et, et, et là nous ne sommes plus dans ce rituel qui a existé depuis la nuit des temps mais nous sommes dans l'application euh, de règles, de lois exigées par euh, les pouvoirs publics l'État, euh, c'est pourquoi euh, le rôle a été dévolu au maire pas au préfet au maire, tout dépend de l'endroit où on se trouve. Si vous êtes dans un avion, tout le monde le sait, c'est le commandant de bord. Si vous êtes dans un navire, ça peut être effectivement, là encore, le capitaine de bateau. Dans la cité, c'est le maire qui procède à, ou son remplaçant, en tout cas, l'un de ses adjoints qui sera chargé de ses unions. Et puis, bien entendu, il y a le mariage religieux, mais nous n'en avons pas parlé, nous avons plutôt parlé ici du mariage civil. Donc, alors, dans ce mariage civil, la première chose sera surtout de permettre, euh, euh, celui qui va officier, s'appellera donc l'officier d'état civil, ce ne sera plus les deux familles en présence avec un représentant et la présence de la société tout entière qui va veiller à, et qui va sceller l'union en présence et avec l'absolution du père, là, nous sommes dans quelque chose de totalement différent. Les deux conjoints se choisissent, on considère qu'ils se sont choisis, ils viennent à leur famille, avec leur famille en tant qu'assistants, assistants dans le fait de venir juste voir ce qui se passe comme de simples curieux, avec chacun un ou deux témoins. Euh, il, il, alors, il y a une procédure hein, qui est connue, qui consiste à aller voir euh, 
avec la publication des bancs et tout ce qui s'en suit. Hein. Euh, bon, euh, le but étant ici que le statut, de, le mariage est le statut le plus protecteur pour que le conjoint survivant et l'héritier soit l'héritier légal de son époux ou de son épouse. C'est-à-dire qu'on est là dans quand même quelque chose de très euh, qui relève du droit euh, avec des règles bien précises. Voilà, il faut protéger l'autre, euh, il faut veiller à l'éducation des enfants, il faut veiller à un certain nombre de choses. Nous sommes euh, au-delà de ce que nous avons connu tout à l'heure, où c'est vraiment… Euh, en fait, la différence serait que ici, dans ce cas de figure, nous avons un lien entre deux personnes avec pour témoins la famille et les amis. Et la société, par son représentant, le maire, qui vient officier, donc officier d'État civil, qui viendra, c'est cela, avec une bague, avec un registre, etc. Alors, alors bien entendu, c'est juste pour garantir des droits. Des droits de protection, la sécurité sociale, euh, euh, si jamais l'un meurt, l'autre héritera de cela. Alors que dans le cadre du mariage, coutumier ou traditionnel, on est dans quelque chose d'autre, de totalement différent, qui d'abord qui se déroule dans le temps, mais également qui lie deux familles, deux clans et deux tribus, ce qui n'est pas le cas. C'est-à-dire que dans le, le cas de, du mariage traditionnel, quand on, a fini, on renverse du vin sur le sol et ce, 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 pour montrer que le liquide qui est rentré dans le sol ne reviendra plus, on ne va plus le retirer, c'est fini. Il arrive des fois, dans certaines sociétés, on casse un verre. Pour dire, voilà, ce qui est fait aujourd'hui est scellé définitivement. Tandis que dans le mariage dit euh, civil, écoutez, on signe des papiers, si on n'est pas d'accord, on arrête. Donc voilà un peu où je vais en arriver et le complément sera donné éventuellement par l'éclairage de vos questions, parce que vous en doutez, on pourrait encore en parler pendant des heures. Merci pour votre attention et je reste à l'écoute de vos questions et pour des éclaircissements si vous le souhaitez. Thank you, thank you very much, Your Excellency. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, pity that we only have to be limited to the 15 minutes. It does appear like we had so much uh, to share with us, but I, like you are saying, there will be an opportunity for um, attendees to ask questions at the end. Uh, thank you so very much for um, your presentation. So uh, if I were to sort of summarize, I think you have already done the summary at the end to say that, you know, talking customary marriage, uh, it's, the two involved, but then it's the family, it is the community, it is society, you know, and then there's sort of all these rituals to ensure that whatever that has brought them together is respectable. And they're recognizing that this actually forms the nucleus of society. And therefore to introduce all of that, to bring them on board as the new couple, the whole society gets shaken and get excited about this uh, relationship uh, being established. He also introduced the fact that there are quite a number of symbols or rituals, if you like, that take place there, some of which indicating the importance and the solemnity of the whole exercise. Much as it is serious, it is still a joyous uh, occasion. Uh, thank you so much, Your Excellency. Uh, can we now, Excellencies, um, call upon Her Excellency, Ms. Mutongi Njogu um, from Kenya? Her Excellency Mutongi Njogu is a managing partner and head of commercial and, and corporate law at Njogu and Associates Advocates. Um, her educational background includes, for instance, LLB honors from Moi University in 2007, um, law diploma from Kenya School of Law in 2009, the MBA in strategic management from the United States um, International University, USIU. Ms. Njogu brings in the wealth of experience from the public and private sector where she was, or that she has served for the last 10 years. She has vast experience offering legal advice uh, to leading uh, commercial entities in Kenya in the banking information technology and manufacturing industries while working for Kirundi and company advocates. Ms. Njogu is also a specialist in matters of public procurement, arbitration, 
and anti-corruption, having gained the experience of working for the office of the chief justice by providing corruption mapping and compliance strategies. She's a certified integrity assurance officer by the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission and has attended several trainings and workshops in this area of expertise. Ms. Njogu is a certified mediator from the Mediation Training Institute, Chartered Arbitrator from the Chartered Institute Arbitrator of Arbitrators, CIA, um, Commissioner for Oaths and a Notary Public. She is also a deeply passionate as well in emerging technologies, Internet of Things, for instance, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, blockchain, and uh, machine learning and cybersecurity, and their aid to assist in access of justice. She's certified in blockchain technology uh, from the Oxford University, Said, Said School of uh, Business, and has attended several training and uh, courses uh, in the same. This is coupled, of course, with an in-depth knowledge on matters of privacy and security of data. My sister, Mutongi, Mutoni Njogu. Uh, welcome, my sister. You are rich with so much to share with us. Take us through, Your Excellency, civil and customary marriage is one more important than the other. Your 15 minutes starts now, Your Excellency. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for having me. Um, I want to talk from a cup of a, of a lawyer. I want to wear my legal hat at this particular moment in time. And I thank the previous speaker for really taking us through what customary law is all about. So when I wear my legal cap, um, I will answer the question, between civil and customary marriage, which one is more important? So as a lawyer, I will be allowed to have this view. And of course, um, during the question and answer session, um, you are allowed to you know, disagree with me, but all marriages are the same, <laughs> irregardless of whether it is a customary marriage or it's a civil marriage, or it's a religious marriage, whether I'm Hindu, it doesn't matter, as long as under the law, they are all the same. Because at the end of it all, they share the same attributes, they share the same incidents attaching to them. So at this point, I'm just wearing my legal hat and just slightly differing that maybe under customary law, there's a bit of processes that actually go into it and how that completely crystallizes into a marriage. But for it to be recognized under the law, it is the same as me having gone to a registrar of marriages and actually undertaken um, a marriage there with my two witnesses or four witnesses, nonetheless. So allow me to start it off um, from, from the very word go from a religious background. When we started off in what is this called institution of marriage, we started it off from the book of Genesis chapter two verses 18 when God desired that indeed the woman will need a help, the man will need a helper for him to look under the kingdom of what the garden of Eden was and all the beauty that it brought in. So from a spiritual um, standing, we say that yes, man was allowed to leave his home, his father and his mother and join in with this woman and together they become one flesh. Now, if we take it a bit now and, and bring it into the realm of the law, this is where we say that a marriage is basically the voluntary union of one man, one woman, to the exclusion of others. But then there's a caveat there. The law sometimes allows for us to look at monogamous marriages, but we've just been taken through a whole process of what a customary marriage is. 
And a customary marriage in basically most of our African culture will find that there's a lot of polygamy within the African culture. So for us, for even from a Kenyan perspective, we do appreciate that there is the marriage that is what is called a polygamous marriage, which has really enshrined a lot of the culture that somebody ascribes to or the community and all those rites and passages that actually come into it. But the thing to point out, to note is that when we think about a marriage, a marriage is basically one that is registered under the law. It has to be registered under the law. I may have gone through all the rigors, all the rituals, all the passages that under, undertake to a certain custom. But if I do not register my marriage under the law, then it is not recognized as one. So yes, again, I answered the question that all marriages are equal. As long as they're in the face of the law, they are all completely equal. So marriages, when we look at marriages, they are normally captured under the very supreme law of each and every country. Even if the country is South Africa, even if the country is Tanzania, you most find that marriages are recognized within the constitutions of these countries. Every sovereign country will definitely have an identifier that states that most people or partners within a marriage have equal rights to a marriage. And these equal rights will look like in the face of um, at the point we got into the marriage, during the marriage and at the dissolution of marriage. So every single party who comes into a marriage has an equal right within that particular parameter. So I will not completely go exactly into what exactly constitutes a customary marriage because I believe the wonderful speaker who was before me has really gone into in depth of what exactly that looks like. It has the connotation of family. It has the connotation of you know, society within it all that embrace that at the end of it all, when we have gone through all those processes, we will find that we have a man and a woman and they have gone through all the rights. And at the, at the end of it all, we now did them as husband and wife. So we do define legally from a legal perspective, just to bring it back again, for me wearing my legal hat, we do define it as a marriage celebrated in accordance with the customs of the communities of one or both of the parties to the intended marriage. And they must be sealed by something we call payment of dowry. But it depends again, what is the culture? Does the culture dictate that dowry is one of the things that seals the marriage or seals the conclusion of the marriage? So in most African cultures, in most that I am well aware of, and which even if it was brought to a court of law, there's normally, there's normally a, dow a dowry element towards it. And what, what I think um, Jarvis was talking about is maybe you ask for beer, you ask for cattle, you ask for goats, as long as there's that symbol that signifies that indeed you technically bought the girl or bought the lady, so that is the seal or the token that actually constitutes the fact that now we have what we call a complete customary marriage. For us, from a Kenyan perspective, we did go ahead, and maybe the rest of the speakers can speak to their various jurisdictions, we did go ahead and make it a requirement that you actually have to register this marriage. Why do we need to register this marriage? Because sometimes um, we've had the scenario whereby you find that people just like one another, a man and a woman like one another, and they do not want to go through the rigors of the customary marriage or the civil marriage. And once they, fight, they, they undertake that level of cohabitation, they now will be deciding later on in life, were they actually married or were they not married or whatever that they were engaging in resembled a marriage. So from a Kenyan perspective, we were able to come up with laws that allow us to register it. Three months down the line, you should register there the marriage that it has actually occurred and, and you have subscribed to a particular community or culture and, and all the rights and passages that pertain to that community or that culture have actually been undertaken. And it's sort of a seal of approval. It's registered with the Register of Marriages, acknowledging the fact that now you are married. But it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to. 
But if you don't, then towards the, you know, towards more years to come, assumably something does happen to you, will now be forced to come back and then try to see were they actually married or were they not actually married. So when we move on to the years and we see that, uh, allow me to just speak on to, 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 to this statement. When we move on, um, when we say that now we're trying to decipher were these people married or not, what normally happens from a legal perspective, you're trying to see whether um, if Mozoni was married to, you know, to, to MJ, if she was married to him, can we presume that a marriage occurred? So we, what we call what we call a presumption of marriage. So we stayed, me and you together, we sired children, we decided, you know what? The marriage ceremony is not so important at this point in stage. Anyway, the kids are big enough, so we do not want to undergo through the rituals of customary law. We do not want to do a civil marriage. But then unfortunately, one of us passes on. So at that point of passing on, we are trying to identify, am I a wife to even inherit what my husband had? So we are now coming to a point of where we are seeing, was there a presumption of marriage? But a presumption of marriage is what we call a judge-made marriage. It has to go now again to a court of law so that the judge can look from all the evidence surrounding that union, whether indeed you are married. So is it important to register your customary marriage if your jurisdiction permits? Please do. Please actually do, because moving forward, it's going to bring a little bit of more issues and somebody has to go to court where the judge is going to make a finding were you married or were you not married? And if the facts and evidence are not in your favor, unfortunately, you may have lived with somebody for almost 10, 12 years, and the, church, and the court decides you are actually not married at all. So when a presumption is made by the court, um, I liken it to what we call presumption, you're presumed innocent until proven guilty. So a presumption is basically a court adapting a particular attitude based on the evidence surrounding it that indeed there was a marriage there. So what would the, the factors that the court would be looking at to see whether you're married? One, it could be children. It could be some relatives knew you. Um, it could be, you know, some neighbors knew you. So those are the kind of things that the court would be looking at to make that presumption of a marriage. So do you want to get there? From a legal perspective, I would say you do not want to get there because that is more litigation and litigation at the end of it all will definitely cost you some money, which I refuse. I say I don't mind the legal work, but it will cost you some money. So it's very important that somebody does register their traditional marriage or customary marriage. So what's the difference between the customary marriage and the civil marriage? Well, the civil marriage, as, as had rightfully been uh, spoken about prior, is just a marriage where you go before a state officer, and this person happens to be the registrar of marriages, and you sign with two witnesses um, who are there that indeed you now become husband and wife. There are processes towards how that is undertaken, and I think some of you have been lucky enough to be married. Um, where there is an, if there is an objection to you getting married, of course, there's a 21 day notice, whether somebody can put in an objection or cannot put in an objection. So basically it's just before a registrar of marriages who is able now to see that you have your witnesses in order, there is no objection from anyone where the two of you should not get married. And then it is registered against the registrar the, the register of marriages. And again, it has to be put in the register of marriages because then if that doesn't happen, then the law doesn't recognize, doesn't recognize you as being married. So once, um, if there is any objection, again, that can prolong your marriage to whoever your intended sweetheart is, hopefully that there's nobody else out there who is claiming a right to you. So for us as well, um, marriages are, civil marriages are conducted within your country of jurisdiction. But if you have um, probably there's something you need to get married for one reason or another, you're probably going out of the country, even within your own 
foreign missions that can also happen. There's always a registrar in the various foreign missions that allows you to be married as well. So just going back to the question, which one is more important than the other? From a legal perspective, all the marriage, all marriages, all types of marriages are equal. But we say the way that the formation of these marriages is what makes it a difference. The customary marriages has to be sealed by, it has to be sealed by all the rights and rituals that are pertain to that particular community. And again, if you want to fortify your marriage, please have it registered. If within your jurisdiction, that is something that is permissible within its own regulations, have that marriage registered. And again, if it's a civil marriage, ensure that the certificates have been signed, that it has been done in front of the witnesses. And again, that has been placed in the registrar of marriages. And I just want to say that even as marriages are, you know, are very important, it's been very sad to see even from, from our end as legal practitioners that the decline of marriage is something that we're seeing quite a lot. And especially during this time of the pandemic, so many things have happened and there's been a rise in the fall down of this particular institution. I think I'm through with my presentation. Um, Thank you, MJ. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, my sister. Thank you very much, Matoni. Matoni. Um, yes, you are really hitting it on the head, eh? Um, <laughs> when we try to compare the two, you're saying, wait a minute, yeah. they actually are the same. In yeah. particular, I like the idea that you're saying, depending, of course, on the jurisdictions where we are and country by country, but I think what you are saying is almost common just about all of our countries, more or less, yes. that you've got to ensure that marriage is registered, whether exactly. it is customary or otherwise, because yes, we are starting a new family, mm -hmm. but at the same time, down the line, there might come a time whereby one of us may have to depart. Exactly. And then when that happens, how do you make sure that whatever you have accumulated over this time gets seriously and well protected so that there are no chaotic uh, situations thereafter? Uh, thank you so much. And I also saying that when it comes to even your customary marriage, yes, we observe all the rituals and respect all that ought to be done there. But at the end of the day, get it registered. Exactly. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Thank you thank very you. much. And also your presentation was really spot on and uh, to the point. Uh, Excellencies, you. you will have uh, the opportunity to ask questions um, at the end. Otherwise, right now, I would like us to move on. Um, the uh, next um, speaker, our panelist for today, um, Advocate Tabo Seneke. Uh, Tabo, please forgive me if I'm messing up your last name there, but somewhere there, Seneke or Seneke uh, from the Republic of uh, South Africa. Uh, Advocate Tabo Donald Seneke, AJ, was admitted in an attorney of the High Court in 1997. He served as a deputy director in the Department of Agriculture and Rural Development for a few years before serving uh, pupillage and uh, being admitted as an advocate uh, of the High Court of South Africa in 2004. He is passionate about land reform and customary law. He has been a commentator on various media platforms, articulating issues of customary marriage. Thus, we are blessed to have you to actually do that here for the benefit of all of us. In June uh, 2021, Advocate Seneca was recommended for silk status, that is senior counsel, uh, by the Pan-African Bar Association of South Africa, Fabasa. He serves in several boards as a non-executive director and currently serves as an acting judge of the High Court, North Houting Division. Tabo, Your Excellency, my brother, take us through this very important topic, customary marriage, or the civil and customary marriage. 
is one more important than the other. Over to you, my brother. Your 15 minutes starts now. Thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Facilitator. I'm not sure if you can, you're yeah, all able to see me. I've switched on my video. Are you able to see me? I can see you very well, my brother. Even though I can't see myself. And can you hear me as well? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes. Thank you. I'm just making note of time. And thank you for that uh, polished uh, introduction, which uh, I'm quite surprised. Someone must have done a good job. Just in terms of uh, South African customary law, before the uh, what is called the new South Africa in 1994, South African's customary law was less recognized under the previous uh, government of uh, apartheid. It was just a disjointed and informal process, which was followed by various uh, groups of in, within the black communities. So since 1994 and since the passing of the, our constitution in 1996, the customary law has been recognized. And as a result of the provision of the constitution, a relevant statute was uh, passed by parliament. The name of the applicable act is the Recognition of Customary Marriages Act 120 of 1998. Now, this act recognizes that uh, black people who, cho who choose the route of getting married via customary marriages, such marriages are recognized as proper marriages, unlike in the previous situation before the the 1994 uh, dispensation where everyone was allowed to vote, including black people. Now, in terms of our the, the act, the Customary Marriages Act, the main provision is the what who qualifies to be um, married in terms of customary law. The basic principles in, in terms of uh, Section three of the Recognition Act is that the prospective spouses must be above the age of 18 years, must both consent to be married to each other under customary law, and such marriage must be negotiated and entered into or celebrated in accordance with customary law. Now, the difficulty with this law is that uh, it was the issue of how do you interpret, especially the provision uh, relating to negotiation. Negotiation pertains to the main aspects is usually the, the agreement to pay in South African law, we either call it Maradi or Lowola. What I think my colleague in, uh, my colleagues in, I think in Kenya, refer to dowry, paying of, payment of dowry. In the old days, this used to be in the form of exchange of cattle. But uh, these days, this is in the form of uh, monetary exchange. So that does not present a problem. But the, the big problem was, what is the meet, meaning of entered into and celebrated in accordance with customary law? That then became the, the center of legal contestation in, in, this, in our South African legal system. Some of the judges tended to say a mere payment or agreement to pay lobola or dowry was enough to lead to what is called a customary marriage. However, sometimes in 2011, there was a seminal judgment by an acting judge in uh, Johannesburg, the case of Mutuatua versus Roro. In terms of that judgment, 
the then uh, the acting judge stated that handover is a prerequisite. So even if you have agreed to all the other aspects, such as how much should be paid in the form of dowry and the age of the parties getting involved in the consent until the prospective wife is handed to the family. So the handover is not only the handover to the husband, but it has to be the handover to the family of the husband. So the wife is then handed over to the family. So that judgment then said, if that aspect is not complied with, then you do not have a marriage. That, that from 2011 became the jurisprudence of South African law in customary marriage. That pertained until 2019, 30 September 2019. There was a judgment that came before the Supreme Court of Appeal. The Supreme Court of Appeal in South Africa is the second highest court below the Constitutional Court. That was the judgment of Mbungela, the matter that emanated from our eastern province, which is called Mpumalanga, which is in, 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 uh, bordering Swaziland and, and Mozambique. <clears throat> the court then decided that uh, one can waive what is called handover. So that, that court decision created a precedence that uh, you can still have a customary marriage, even in circumstances where there has not been a handover. That case was then followed um, last year by a case which emanated from the Johannesburg High Court. It is a case that uh, involved a, a young man who was in showbiz. His name was, his stage name was WHP. He passed away after completing suicide or committed suicide. And his uh, partner, uh, Ms. Singadi, brought an agent application before the High Court wanting to uh, bury him and also be in charge of his estate. That court case was challenged and at the high court, the judge decided that it, is, it was not necessary to for handover. Handover was no longer a prerequisite that uh, a marriage could still take place notwithstanding the fact that handover has not taken place and that handover can be waived. In fact, that judgment came before the Mungela judgment. So that was the judgment on the 3rd of November, 2018. And as I said, the year later in 2019, September, there was a judgment of Mungela at the Supreme Court of Appeal. The judgment in WHP was then taken to the Supreme Court of Appeal the Supreme Court of Appeal last year, somewhere in mid-June or May, decided uh, to follow the judgment of Mbungela in stating that uh, handover was no longer a prerequisite for a customary marriage to be valid. We were then briefed in this matter the, because it created, there was a confusion that was created as a result of these two judgment, the judgment, the WHP judgment, as well as the Mbungela judgment. As uh, before the two judgments, there was a Supre Supre uh, Supreme Court of Appeal judgment, uh, Moropani versus Southern. That decision of Moropani versus Southern, which was a 2014 judgment, confirmed the approach that handover was still a requirement. The difficulty that we had with the Mbungela and the WHP cases in the Supreme Court of Appeal was that the Supreme Court of Appeal in dealing with these two cases did not do away with the Moropani judgment. In other words, the Supreme Court of Appeal, which had the Moropani judgment in 2014, and later in 2019 and 2020 had the subsequent judgments, did not say there was something wrong with the Moropani judgment. 
And as a result, you have got the coexistence of the precedence that was set in Moropani judgment, which stated that handover is still a requirement on the one hand. On the other hand, you had these two judgments, being the judgment of Mbungela and the judgment of WHP, stating that handover can be waived. And subsequent to the two judgments, there were uh, judgments from the high courts, the one in the high court in, in the Eastern Cape, uh, where one of the judges said, in fact, handover has become superfluous. He even went to an extent of saying that women are not goods to be delivered. And accordingly, uh, Judge Dakota said that uh, handover is completely a non-requirement. So as it is, we were then briefed to take the matter to the Constitutional Court, the matter of WHP. We drafted the papers. The matter was supposed to serve before the Constitutional Court of South Africa in February this year. Unfortunately, the applicant, our client, the father of the late WHP, uh, passed away in December uh, 2019. So this matter had to be postponed while we were awaiting a substitution of uh, his executor as a new applicant. So that is where the South African uh, situation stands with regard to uh, customary law. At the moment, we do not know where we are, but currently the prevailing judgments are that um, once you've paid Lobolo and there's some sort of ceremony, even at the wife, uh, at the prospective wife's uh, place, because that is where the Lobola or the dowry is delivered. According to these two judgments, that kind of constitute a customary marriage. Now, the difficulty in South Africa with uh, that kind of law is that it is not the law that is reflected in the practice of the communities. The communities have got a different uh, understanding of what customary, what constitutes customary law. So the reality is that when the court uh, interprets what constitutes customary law, uh, there's no synergy, there's no relationship between what pertains to the practical way of dealing with it and what is practiced by the judiciary. So our attempt to bring to take the matter to the constitutional court was to ultimately bring some form of understanding and uniformity in the application of the of the law pertaining to customary uh, marriages. But now the difficulty in South Africa, we have a system where we have got about three types of marriages. We've got what is called in communal property. The second type of marriage is called out of communal property. The third of out of community of property with accrual, and the third form of marriage is out of community of property without accrual. Now, in South African law, for you to qualify to be married in terms of to be married out of community, you have to sign what uh, is commonly known as a prenup, prenupt, prenuptial. In South Africa, it is commonly known as the antinuptial. And the, the, the colloquial name of the antinuptial contract is ANC, not to be confused with the African National Congress, the governing party in South Africa. Now, in South Africa, for your, mar your marriage to be out of community or property, you must conclude the antinuptial contract before you enter into uh, a customary marriage. In this instance, it means that even before you send your delegations to go and negotiate for payment of for the dowry or lobola. You must already be entering into a, a prenup or antinuptial contract. Otherwise, once you pay lobola or dowry, your marriage automatically becomes marriage in, in communal property. Now, the difficulties present themselves when, of course, the parties are no longer in good terms, this, the relationship is strained, the marriage is breaking down. That is when parties, to their shock, suddenly realize that they have entered 
found themselves in a quandary, in a difficult situation. The other instance, of course, is where one of the parties passes away. That is mostly that's when these cases become come before court because that is where at the time when parties are attempt to assert their right to vindicate their right, and and some various issues then arise, and that is where we find ourselves. So those are the, some of the difficulties. There is. Uh, this, uh, I think it's take, taken for granted that marriages favor women. But we, we know like in a country like South Africa, I'm sure the same with Kenya, especially countries where women are, are also empowered to economically, educationally, there are women who might be disadvantaged by marriages which are in communal property. So it does not follow that a marriage in communal property automatically uh, favors a, a female, even though in most cases, given the nature of patriarchy, men are likely to have accumulated more in property than women. But it might be a double-edged sword, and this is the case that we are making at the uh, constitutional court to say that, let's say in case, let's a man who's in a risky situation, who is a, in business situation, and he goes, uh, he's sequestrated. That if in, where there's a marriage in community of property, automatically the wife will also be sequestrated because the uh, proprietary interests are intertwined. So that is one of the issues. The other issue that we have highlighted in our case is where there's an inheritance, where a female, the, the wife inherits money from, could be money from, parents, though that money if is not excluded from the will of the testator, that uh, the property then falls into the common property. But those are just uh, the broad issues around the South African precedence when we deal with issues pertaining to customary marriages. I will pause for now. I hope I've not uh, taken too much of the allocated time to me. Hi, Tabo. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Um, I think you actually spot on in terms of time. We are still good. Um, I think you have actually highlighted some interesting stuff here. The cases you have quoted, they seem to suggest that because of, quote unquote, the lateness of um, the customary marriage coming into the scene in the case of South Africa, there is that kind of you know, confusion now as to you know what happens when such occurrences um, hit us, uh, but fortunately there is a realization that these ought to be dealt with one way or the other, and work is underway. But fortunately, you have also highlighted the fact that the differences uh, between customary marriage and the civil marriage. The civil marriage, you didn't say much about it. I'm, I'm sure because this has been around for some time a number of people will understand as to how you go forward with it. But obviously when it comes to the issue of, you know, uh, in marrying in community of property, uh, in the ANC issue that you just referred to, um, surely people ought to be advised accordingly as to how to move forward when such decisions have to be taken. Especially what was quite clear to me was that if you engage in terms of the process of negotiations and even paying dowry, Yet your intention is to be uh, to marry that particular person or partner out of community of property, but you start the process already of nullified that. Uh, it seems to suggest that you know your civil marriage seems to be the default marriage you know, until and unless somebody comes up to say, "Hey, this is the way we're going to go." If you don't declare, then you know uh, civil marriage takes over according to what you've just uh, put forward. But nonetheless, I don't want to mess up your presentation, Your Excellency. And also Excellencies uh, attending will have the opportunity to ask uh, questions. Uh, now, this after the last uh, speaker. Can I now, Excellencies, move on to um, the next speaker? Uh, if technical can show us the the brief here. 
um, our next speaker. I'm hoping, yes, thank you very much. Yes, uh, we have His Excellency Costa Kasoma from Angola. His Excellency Costa Kasoma holds a bachelor's degree in English language, uh, a teaching methodology from ISCED, which is Angola Teachers Training uh, Institute. He's an English and Portuguese language teacher, as well as a professional translator and interpreter. Uh, Mr. Kasoma is a board member and co-founder of Cladrad, the Southern Africa Translators Club. He is also a youth in Africa ambassador from Angola. Um, we're happy to have you, Your Excellency. Do share with us your views on this very interesting and important uh, topic in us, helping us decide and have an idea as to between civil and customary marriage is one more important than the other. Your Excellency, your 15 minutes starts now. Over to you. I am searching frantically to see as to whether His Excellency is with us. Oh, okay. It looks like His Excellency is not online. What a pity. We would have loved to hear um, from a young person as well as to which is which, which one is more important uh, than the other as far as civil and customary marriages are concerned. Now, in the absence of His Excellency um, Costa, this now gives us even more time to engage uh, on the presentation or the, on the topic at hand. Excellencies, please, you're going to um, raise your hand as usual. Technical is going to help us unmute uh, the excellencies to put forward their questions. Maybe for a start, we'll sort of indicate the question you want answered, and also, if possible, indicate which one of the panelists you'd like to respond to the question. If it's, however, open question for any of them to respond, you indicate. Let's take maybe first three questions and see how we go uh, from now. Any questions or excellencies, you raise your hand and then technical is going to help us uh, to unmute uh, those that would have raised their hands. I can see His Excellency uh, John Kaoya's hand is up. If you can unmute yourself, Excellency, in case uh, you are able to do so, John Kawia, Excellency. Or let me put it this way, any of the three that will be able to unmute themselves will have an opportunity to go first. There's Excellency Hilda Peto and Excellency Leto Musa. Similane. Your Excellency. Wow. Go ahead, Excellency Hilda. We can hear you. Good afternoon, Excellencies. Good afternoon, Excellency. Yes, wow, wonderful presentations. 
I don't know if I'm throwing a spanner into the works, but my question is, is very broad and it's for any of the wonderful presenters, the honorable members to answer. I'm in a quandary as a, as a parent and as a, as a citizen, because I'm realizing that as much as there's clear lines between customary and civil marriages, either or, but my question is in the middle because I'm finding that with all the hardships uh, that we are facing during these times where most of our young ones are, um, have become unemployed, gone back home, they've lost you know, the, the ability to get income. The customary marriage is based on one or the, the man having some income in order to be able to approach the, the bride's home, the family. And unfortunately, what I'm finding, which has become quite common, is that the children just decide that whether it's, it's no, no longer either or, they just cohabit, or we call it fat and set in South Africa, where they decide that because I don't have money, we both need, we love each other and want to be together. We would love to please the parents, but unfortunately, we can't go the customary way we can't even go the civil way, but they do what they, 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 they would normally do in both situations anyway. And then I find them, the conflict that comes from the Christian background where we, we, we would want, want them to get into holy matrimony, the Christian way. And then I'm finding that it's become difficult, especially in churches as a pastor, what to do because congregants now who were living apart, wishing to be married, suddenly have no ways of coming together the right way, if you want to say. They just cohabit and it has the same results. They get kids, they stay together. They, there's everything that we would do if you were in a customary or civil marriage. I, I, I just, I'm throwing it out there. I don't know what is going, how, what's going to come out. But I'm saying I'm finding that day in and day out being consulted that here we are, we are your members staying together, wanting to get married, wishing in love, but there's no money. What do we do? It, it, are these marriages making room for the changing economic times or are they allowing for room to transform with the times? Is there no common ground where we can help our children? Thank you, Your Excellency. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Yes, uh, that's quite an interesting uh, question you're raising. But let's note it there. As parents, as the church, how do we advise, given these current economic times? These people are in love, they want to get married, but according to customary law, they've got to part with something in the form of lobola or dowry. And likewise, on the other side, um, I'm not sure there, maybe let's sort of um, hang on to that question and we'll have it open to all the panelists. Um, can we move on to the next question? I'll just take um, another two more. Thank you, Excellency uh, Hilda. Yes, Excellency Kawia. Thank you very much. Um, three quick questions. Uh, the first one is to do with the Lobola in the sense that uh, the speaker from Kenya uh, mentioned that uh, most of the uh, people in Africa uh, pay lobola. I just wanted to say that uh, in my case from, ori from originally from Malawi, I in our tribe, which is a long way tribe and it's uh, a significant tribe in Malawi in terms of population, uh, we don't actually, we don't pay lobola. Uh, if I married, from my tribe, and it's the same tribe from Mozambique. We came from Mozambique, uh, the Lomwes. Um, They just have a, um, like a chicken you, to go just when they are proposing the lady, our, my parents would go and do that and they just celebrate with a chicken or something. So I don't know whether that would be what is considered by uh, our uh, speaker as a, a lobola because it's not as serious as a, a dowry. That's the first thing. And uh, I think it's uh, 
only that uh, because my wife is from the north and they uh, pay lobola, uh, so I had to pay lobola, but my children uh, were not, I will not require lobola from them, according to our culture. Uh, that's the first one. The second question is the, on the issue that was presented by the, uh, 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 the speaker from South Africa. Uh, I hope I'm right. There was only one speaker from South Africa. And this is to do with the, I'm just thinking hard and uh, getting worried to say, does it mean that uh, uh, me and my wife should be uh, speaking and uh, thinking as a couple, what we want to see happen uh, to either one of us, especially my wife, in case I were to die first before her, because the law seems to be favoring men than women. And I want to agree with the speaker from South Africa because like one of my aunties said and say, you know what, when you die, what we do is simply we just go and pick whatever we find. And they are talking from a traditional practices, not from the legal perspective. And that's uh, sometimes the, the wheels of law in our society are slower than the practices and the rituals, traditional rituals in our villages. And maybe they may not even have legal power, let's say my wife or, or, or somebody from their side to try to protect their children's uh, inheritances and even my wife's. They could just uh, um, overspeed or, or overtake the law. And maybe the country may not have the capacity to even uh, have a recourse in favor of the wife. How do you handle that, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, from South Africa? Uh, the last question is, uh, I think the issue of decline in marriages globally is becoming an area of great concern um, as a spiritual leader, as a pastor. And I think it's something that as a church, what can we do about it? Um, in terms of our influence in the country, but not more from a reactive perspective, but uh, from a proactive to say, is it something we need to go back and begin to rebuild the values in our young people so that uh, when they grow and they are ready for marriage, they are not going to espouse values based on just uh, their legal rights, but they are based on biblical principles. As the Bible says, it was not so in the beginning, as Jesus says, something must be going wrong in our society today. And what can we do as the kingdom people, pastors and the, in the society? Thank you. Thank you, Excellency. Thank you very much. Um, you brought in quite an interesting uh, arrangement here, questions buried in another question, but I'm hoping that it won't take that long. Can I give Ule Tumusa uh, Simelane an opportunity then from there we will uh, allow the panelists to respond. Ule Tumusa, can you unmute yourself? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity and thank you very much for having me as part of uh, this uh, amazing presentation. Mine is not a question, it's just a comment. Um, coming from a very strong Christian background and being a traditionalist in Swaziland, I will agree with the, the speakers that uh, civil and customary marriage are the same. But taking it from the Swaziland perspective, I will say they are not the same because it's much easier to divorce under civil rights marriage 
and it's a mountain. It's, it's a very, very difficult thing to do, especially with the customary marriage. And my advice would be, I wish the Christian community in Swaziland will understand what it means to marry under the customary marriage. Because most people, they say these marriages are the same. And my understanding is lots of Christians, they don't know the, 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 the rituals involved in the customary marriage, especially in Swaziland. Let me make a good example. The bride has to be smeared with a red oak and the goat must be slaughtered. And they, this symbolizes something. And with, with us in Swaziland, under the customary marriage, it's not the two people who are in marriage who are marrying each other, but rather it's the two families who are marrying each other, meaning it's the two surnames which are coming together with four surnames which will make eight surnames coming together in the ancestral perspective. It means it's the, the two families, the ancestors coming together, which is why a lot of people, they don't understand what it means, I mean, to marry under the customary marriage, especially in Swaziland. And a lot of them, when they want to get divorced, it becomes very, very difficult because Swazi law and custom doesn't permit a, a divorce, especially under the customary marriage. Thank you. Thomas, thank you very much, Swati uh, Lagiti. Um, that is an interesting observation there. Um, we're talking about customary marriage versus civil marriage. And you're bringing in quite an interesting observation that under customary marriage, particularly in the case of Swati, I know some parts of uh, Southern Africa, it becomes very difficult to actually uh, institute a divorce. Yet on the civil marriage side, it's a matter of just a snap of the fingers and then off you are gone. Can we now hold it here and then ask our panelists uh, to comment on this and then we'll proceed. Um, there is a question which was really more, very much open, which was asked by Her Excellency Hilda Petal uh, regarding you know, the difficulty that our kids are now finding themselves you know, in terms of having to pay Lobola and the expenses that are associated with marriage and therefore opting for cohabitation that is, you know, it's just living with somebody uh, without having married that person. And these, we have challenges even in the church, not only just uh, as a parent. Um, would there be a comment on just this one for now and then we'll move on to the next? Any of the, of the panelists that want to just uh, comment on this, please uh, give yourself two minutes just to hit it on the head and then so that you can cover all the others. I think uh, His Excellency Tabo is online. Can you go ahead, Your Excellency? Yes, uh, in, in the context of, uh... Cohabitation, I think the difficulties are, as she has, uh, Ms. Petto has indicated, the economic circumstances might uh, yield to these types of cohabitation. You recall that I think in the olden days when uh, uh, we could uh, use livestock to exchange. For, for that purpose, maybe it was easy. But now what is happening is that uh, money has become a factor. And as such, uh, with the, the high rate of unemployment, and also the, rea the reality is that uh, Nobola is prohibitive, especially in South Africa in the context of uh, what I would refer to as Awanguni, uh, uh, members of our society, that is your people from your Swati speaking people of South Africa, your nurse prayed Mpumalanga, your people from uh, KwaZulu Natal, the Zulu speaking, and uh, your Eastern Cape. Your typical Lobola will be, will range between 50 and 100,000 rent. And, not that, and that is just a basic. Uh, uh, initial amount of Lobola. And on top of that, there will be other things like umombe, so the dressing up of the families. And also there will also be a requirement for what is called even a white, a white wedding. So the reality is that young people, given their circumstances, this is also prohibitive. And also it is easy to start families 
without the the commitment of marriage because there are serious consequences with uh, marriages. What you, you then tend to have is that in marriages, you are bound because of the proprietary consequences. That's why you see that in they are the people preferably stay in unhappy marriages because it is costly to be divorced. It, will, it could be that one of the person has done well in accumulation of property. So that person will tend to suffer when in the event of a divorce. Whereas with these uh, informal relationships, once the parties are no longer happy, it is easy to walk away. So those, those will be the two aspects which will play a role. The reality is that young people, as they grow, become young, young men and young women, they're not going to wait and say, yeah, because I cannot get, I cannot afford to pay Lobolo, I'm, my life is going to come to a standstill. So the economic imperatives might force them to enter into these uh, informal types of marriages, which is are called cohabitation. So that, that is why it has become prevalent because families have got high expectations. They, they do not even look at the, the economic circumstances of the, the young people. They simply charge regardless of the affordability. And the, the, the second option becomes cohabitation because the young people are not going to postpone forming families just because they cannot afford to pay the board. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Um, would there be any comment either from the other colleagues among other panelists? Um, yes. Um, for, for, for us, for, yes, for me, I would say this from, uh, from our perspective. When we think about a civil marriage, and I know the, the tendency is to, to run to cohabitation, but I've also witnessed that a lot of times we find that people want to undertake the civil marriage. It does not come with the whole ceremonies. So this you go to the office of the attorney general for us in instance, which is about $15 to actually just undertake the wedding. But now it gives you the right as man and woman under civil law. So you may not have the money for Lobola, which may be much more expensive. So what people do is just go to the office of the attorney general, pay the $15, and then you're just married as man and wife, as opposed to going through the whole dowry process, as opposed to going through the whole, um, you know, flamboyant church wedding. So they opt for that particular purpose, as opposed to just cohabitation. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Yes, um, I'm not sure if there will be another comment. The yes, of course, uh, have I? Excellency. Oui, alors je, je voulais apporter une précision sur euh, un domaine également par rapport à, aux trois questions qui ont été posées. Euh, C'est de dire que une des solutions serait d'expliquer cette tradition. Le vrai problème aujourd'hui, on ne sait pas, on ne connaît pas la tradition et on essaie de juger la tradition avec les éléments modernes d'aujourd'hui. Et on n'a pas compris. La date est quelque chose de symbolique. Ça pourrait même mettre un franc symbolique, un euro symbolique, un dollar symbolique. Ce ne sont pas les millions, les milliards qu'on entend. Et ça, on n'a pas pris le temps. La tradition ne s'oppose pas à la modernité. La tradition ne s'oppose pas à la chrétienté, à la loi chrétienne. Non, elle est complémentaire. Et simplement aujourd'hui, les parents les uns les autres, la société ne sait pas expliquer. La, le, le mariage coutumier apporte la garantie de la société à garder ensemble deux personnes. Alors oui, ça prend du temps, mais ce n'est pas l'affaire de deux personnes, c'est l'affaire de deux familles, deux clans, deux tribus et parfois deux pays. Si on le voit comme ça, c'est bien parce qu'on va vers une stabilité. On va vers quelque chose qui va durer. L'argent, tout ce qui est demandé, n'est pas demandé aux mariés. C'est demandé à la famille. C'est important. Alors, oui, dans ces conditions, il faut réfléchir par deux fois quand il faudra divorcer. Parce que quand on a dépensé tout ça, quand on a mis tout ce temps pour réaliser cela, 
on ne divorce pas. C'est pour ça que symboliquement, on prend du vin de palme que l'on verse par terre pour dire que ce qu'on vient de faire là, c'est fini. On ne revient plus dessus ou bien on casse un verre ou on casse une calebasse. Aujourd'hui, dans la modernité, on va très vite, on fait ça vite, vite, on paye 15 dollars et puis, et puis aussi vite, dans le mois ou les années qui viennent, on arrête. Donc, il faut bien voir ça. Alors, aujourd'hui, la réponse que, que je, donne, je dirais aussi, d'une part, il faut expliquer cette tradition et quand on l'explique, on se rend bien compte que c'est totalement en harmonie avec le reste, même avec le mariage civil. Mais il faut dire que le mariage euh, traditionnel est complété par le mariage civil. C'est-à-dire que même quand vous avez fait ça, aujourd'hui, le droit qui s'applique, ce n'est pas le droit coutumier ou le droit traditionnel, c'est le droit civil, c'est le juge, c'est le président, c'est le maire, c'est la tournée, enfin, ces gens-là. Bien, il est bien, et de plus en plus, on le voit en tout cas en France, quelque chose de complémentaire. Vous allez faire le mariage traditionnel et vous le complétez par le mariage civil pour donner justement une valeur dite juridique à cela. Donc, c'est extrêmement important. Quelqu'un a dit tout à l'heure, oui, mais euh, normalement, on ne donne rien. Une fois de plus, l'explicitation de cela est importante. S'il si faut donner quelque chose. Pourquoi Parce que vous venez casser une, une chaîne familiale où vous retirez quelqu'un, vous partez avec. Il faut remplacer. Donc, c'est ce remplacement-là, c'est cette réparation-là que vous faites en disant, écoutez, je vais donner un euro symbolique, un dollar symbolique, un franc symbolique. Mais ce n'est pas qu'on va payer les gens ou la famille, non. Symboliquement, on dit à la famille, voilà, vous avez élevé votre enfant pendant des années, et eh bien moi je vais vous le prendre cet enfant. Eh bien, en compensation, acceptez un petit, euh, un, un, symboliquement quelque chose. Mais ce n'est pas des millions ou des milliards, on ne peut pas faire ça. Alors aujourd'hui, la coutume est tombée dans le sens, on demande des millions, des milliards, etc. Mais il faut expliquer. Et quand on aura compris, peut-être que ce sera plus facilement accepté, plus facilement respecté, et peut-être qu'on comprendra bien que tout ça, en fait, est complémentaire, aussi bien pour le chrétien, pour la société civile et pour euh, notre tradition qui mérite sincèrement d'être connue et expliquée. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I think you are really hitting something interesting here on the head to say that maybe there is a tendency among some of us whereby we are beginning to twist even the culture of dowry whereby as parents, maybe a parent of my daughter who wants to get married, I then see that person as bringing in wealth to the home. I mean, to me as a father and thus frustrating these young people from getting married. I like it, Your Excellency, when you are saying that we really need to share the knowledge about customary uh, marriage and the, the traditions that go with it. Like you are saying, really emphasizing the fact that when you're exchanging these gifts, you're not necessarily buying anybody, but it's symbolic to bring two families or even you know communities uh, together through that marriage. Uh, there were comments here with regards to, I think somehow you've hinted or touched on the comments that were made by His Excellency John Kawi, whereby um, sometimes would not require that much uh, in terms of Lobola. Others are now actually uh, uh, capitalizing on that and thus frustrating our children and forcing them into cohabitation. Um, Yes, the other issue was that of um, assuming now you are married and then somebody say maybe one of us passes on the issue of grabbing, you know, uh, the, the property by maybe the family of the one that is deceased, you know, how do we actually accommodate or deal with that? And there's also the comment of, I just want to cover all the questions now so that we can move on to the other questions that are coming in, um, where the law tends to sort of slower than customary practice. You know, like that's where we were talking about the issue of people grabbing. How do we handle that? Particularly, I think that was referred to the case of South Africa uh, to say, how do you manage that situation whereby customary practice is such that when this happens, we move only to find that that move is now against the law that is currently in place. And how can we maybe have comments there, Excellency Tabo? 
And you, somebody spoke about the decline in marriages. Yes, some of the things have already been hinted to that, you know, the economic side of things may cause that, thus forcing people into, uh, into cohabitation. The easy divorce, I think is also limited, I mean, uh, covered somehow, uh, where Leto Musa spoke about the issue of the differences between the two, especially when it comes to difficult moments. You know, when customary marriage says stick together because we've brought in so many people, so divorcing shouldn't necessarily be just an easy thing to do. But when it comes to civil uh, marriage, uh, it's just a snap of the finger, you may be off there. But Excellency um, uh, Tabu, can you comment on, on that issue? Yes. Uh, just uh, on the issue of uh, the complex 60s, which are brought by customary marriages, I'm currently handling a case uh, which involves the royal family. One of the royalties passed away, leaving two, two wives. And there are contestations there in terms of uh, who is in charge of the estate. The difficult, in South African law, maybe I'm just uh, make this clear. In South African law, there's no distinction between customary law and civil marriage in terms of the proprietary consequences. So whether you enter marriage in terms of customary law or civil law, the three types of uh, consequences come into play. In community, out of community with accrual, out of community without accrual. So it doesn't matter. But in South Africa, especially the black population, maybe as in anywhere else in the continent, we initiate our marriages through customary law. The civil marriage then comes subsequent to the process of customary law. Now, where you've got more than one wife, in South Africa, the problem is that the first wife, if there's no consent, if the, the, the husband does not get the, the, the first wife to consent to the marriage of the second wife, we have a constitutional court decision, Mayelana versus Ngwenyam, which says, if the, the husband doesn't get the consent of the first wife, the second marriage is then null and void. It is effectively a nullity. It didn't happen. It doesn't exist. It's invalid in other ways. So that is the first instance. The second instance is that then such, it means that such a person while the husband might still be alive, might consider herself to be in marriage. Legally, there's no marriage once the husband passes away. But also even where there's consent by the first wife, the rights of the second wife or the third wife or the fourth are subserv subservient to the rights of the first wife. So in other ways, the first wife takes the lion's share. The other wife, the second, third, the subsequent wives are are regarded, they, they have the value of their, their, their share into the estate is that of a child, what is called a child's share. Now, South African law, in terms of having things like divorces, we do not have difficulties as in Switzerland. In South Africa, if you want to divorce someone in customary marriage, you, you still have to go to court, whether the magistrate's court, the regional court, or the high court. So it's the same way, if you do not do that, we say that marriage has not been dissolved. Now, what we used to have is that before the constitution, we used to have a, 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 a patriarchal system where the, if you have a wife and you pass away and you have married that wife in customary law before 1994 or even 90 before the constitution, then the, 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 your, the brother of the, of the of the husband, deceased husband, could take over the property of the of of his deceased uh, deceased uh, brother, including the wife and the children. But then we had a case in in Cape Town, the, we call it Bear, B H E, where a husband passed away. There was a property in the township in one of the townships in Cape Town. The brother of the deceased wanted uh, to deprive the widow and the children of the property. The matter then eventually ended up in the constitutional court. So the law as it is, is that uh, 
uh, the wife, if the wife is proven to be the wife, is entitled. But now the difficulty is that in most of these cases, you, you need to go to court, especially if in South Africa, there's no requirement that a customary marriage must be registered. It is a recommendation. It is a requirement in terms of the law, but if it is not registered, it does not ma make that marriage unlawful. But for you to vindicate that law, your rights, you then have to go to court. It becomes an expensive exercise. Our courts are very expensive. We have got uh, a, a court system. So may, yeah, I will, I will cut it there. Thank you very much. Sorry for that difference. We are now uh, yeah. uh, pacing against the time, but thanks very much for that submission. Can we handle, can I give an opportunity to His Excellency Pastor Oyebanji uh, for another question that may be the last one because we really have uh, exhausted our time. Your Excellency Pastor Oyebanji. Okay. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, for this privilege. I, I thank all the panelists for this contribution on well, which of them is important, civil or customary marriage. Uh, I, I saw the point that, uh, excellent, I'm not asking a question, I'm just going to put a view. I saw the point that uh, our Excellency had made, that was why I raised up my hand. Now, in, in, in looking at this, in every country, especially in Africa, we are all guided by law. Even the marriages that are done in churches are under the law, whether civil or customary. I think the strength of this discussion should now be where civil law is not exhaustive, customary law is not exhaustive, where does the kingdom law come in to bridge the gap and help us solve the challenges around these laws, the civil law or the customary law? And that is where we should be putting our strength as individuals, as, as families, as global roundtable like this to not begin to provide solutions. You see, we, I've seen somebody raise a point here about the elaborate church wedding. Actually, wedding is not supposed to be elaborate. Wedding is supposed to be between God, the priest, and the people that are getting married. It is the woman culture that built that elaborate aspect of, of marriage. And because people's minds are distorted, basically, one of the greatest challenges affecting marriages across the world is distorted mindset. People don't understand the originality of God's intention for marriage. Whether you put your marriage in civil or customary law, or you allow it to be governed by biblical laws, what matters most is the individual and what is expected from them by their role in that marriage. You see, we have seen civil marriages that succeed. We have seen customary marriage that succeed. And we have also seen kingdom marriage that failed. So, but the truth of the matter is, is about the individuals that are agreeing to enter into that marriage and their commitment to the law that guides the marriage. Where each person understands his or her role and are able to play it, the marriage will succeed, whether it's under civil or customary. But for me, in looking at the premise of the kingdom aspect is to say that we should not begin to advocate and how we can bridge the, the, the limitation of customary marriage and, and civil marriage using biblical principle. And that should be the way forward. Thank you, Your Excellency. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. What a nice way of closing it, to say that we may be struggling between the two, but there is one supreme law. What does God say about marriage? How can we guide each other? How can we guide our young people you know, uh, as pair? Uh, the biblical uh, uh, directives as a God-fearing organization in GBR, as a Christ-based organization in GBR, how then do we bring in God into the picture to say this is the way out now? Um, now, can I, Your Excellencies, uh, move on? Thank you very much, Your Excellencies, for the questions and the discussion that has taken place in here. I do believe that you're working away with our pockets full, so to speak, uh, with this kind of uh, information shared in today's session. May I request um, uh, His Excellency uh, Donovan Landsberg uh, to lead us on the offering side. Over to you, Your Excellency. Uh, greetings, Your Excellencies. Thank you, Your Excellency, Mr. Daba Daba, for this privilege. I really appreciate it. Uh, I would like to start off by reading a scripture which we find in 2 Kings 
chapter 2, verse 5. So she went from him and shut the door behind her and her sons who brought the vessels to her and she poured it out. This relates to the widow who had nothing. They were just about to repossess a property and also take her sons into slavery. So the prophet of God, Elisha, uh, came to her aid and gave her this instruction to take her last oil, her last possession, and to pour it out into empty jars. And we all know what happened. So I'd like to highlight uh, just a few things. Firstly, she gave everything she had. It says here, she poured it out. So there was that act of faith in terms of her pouring it out, giving her it her all. And then the other part is she received more than what she gave. That is a key principle in the kingdom of God, whereby when God blesses, he blesses us more than what we can think, ask, or imagine. So I would like to encourage us to, as we give, the, the details are uh, put on the screen for us to give, to remember that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. God is a rewarder of our faith. So as we give in faith, God will reward us. And if I can also kindly ask for the GBR, GFFJ Thanksgiving video to be played to further encourage us. But before that, let us just approach the throne of God in prayer as we ask for God's guidance. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this opportunity we have, Lord, to receive um, so much, Lord, and the little bit that we need to give Lord, doesn't compare in terms of the reward that you have in store for us. Thank you for making it possible for us to give because we cannot give if we do not have. And thank you for making us obedient to give. And thank you that we can stand ready to receive from you, to receive blessings from above. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Thank you, Your Excellency, for this opportunity. Amen. Thanks, Your Excellency. Thank you very much. Um, can I now? Move on, Excellencies, and request His Excellency Taban Gosi um, for the announcements and the vote of thanks, Your Excellency Taban. Thank you very much, Your Excellencies. Um, Musanda Bandava. Your Excellencies, I greet you all in the wonderful name of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I will go through the global announcements. I will not read them word for word as they are displayed on the screen. And then I will then proceed to do <coughs> the vote of thanks. The next GBR International Session will be held next week on the 18th of September, 2021 on this very same Zoom platform. You are all encouraged to invite family, your friends, your colleagues, as these sessions are free to attend. You are also advised or please advised that you can catch up on all the previous sessions that we've held, the international sessions, by accessing our website, which is www.globalbusinessroundtable.com. Or you can go on to YouTube and you can search for Global Business Roundtable and you'll find all the videos there. All the members would like to propose topics and also the panelists for these international sessions, GBR international sessions, to kindly forward their suggestions to Tabang at globalbusinessroundtable.com. The Global Business Roundtable is proud to introduce its mobile application, which is used for conferences, meetings, sessions, event registrations, live feedback, and polling. The app is available for download on the Google Play Store or on the Apple Store as well. You are all encouraged to download the mobile application. Please note that the GBR Worship CD and DVD is now available on iTunes, YouTube Music, Amazon, and many other digital music stores. 
The worship team provides to us beautiful worship 30 minutes before the session and also 30 minutes after the session. So you're all encouraged to support. You are also invited to register on the GBR network by accessing our website, which is www.globalbusinessroundtable.com. Please note that the GBR Thanksgiving, as well as the Global Fund for Jesus NGO Grant Awards event will be taking place on the 20th of November, 2021 in Johannesburg, South Africa. For more information, you can visit gbrthanksgiving.com. The leadership of GBR and JFFJ requests all members to set aside their Wednesday from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. from January to November as a day of fasting and prayer. All the prayer items are available on our website, which I repeat again, www.globalbusinessroundtable.com. And those are the global announcements. I will now move on to doing the vote of thanks, starting firstly with our facilitator, His Excellency, Mr. <clears throat> Musanda Wandaba, all the way from the Kingdom of Eswatini, standing in for our convener. We thank you very much, Your Excellency, for a well-run program on the topic of civil and customary marriages. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. We'd also like to thank the worship team, which provide us with beautiful worship before the session and also after the session as well. We thank you to the GBR worship team. We also like to pass our thanks to Her Excellency, Mrs. Gawoya, all the way from Botswana for having done the opening prayer. Thank you, Your Excellency. And we'll also like to thank our main presenters. Mr. Luembe from France, Ms. Njongu from Kenya, Advocate Sineke from South Africa, and in absentia, Mr. Costa, Mr. Kosama from Angola. We thank you very much, Your Excellencies, for having availed your time to come and share the very powerful nuggets that you have shared here today about civil and customary message, uh, marriages. We're very grateful for that, Your Excellencies. Thank you very much. We'd also like to thank His Excellency Donovan Landsberg from South Africa, who did the offering for us, reminded us about the reason for giving. As we close, we'd like to thank His Excellency Dr. Pierre Gomat from Gabon, who's gonna come and do the closing prayer. And also would like to thank all those who made comments and asked questions. And for all of you, your excellencies for having attended the session and also together with the technical team for having done a sterling job in running these sessions. Thank you very much, your excellency and God bless. Thank you very much, your excellency. Thank you, really appreciate. Uh, may I now uh, request uh, my brother, his excellency, Dr. Pierre Goma, to sort of lead us in closing prayer. Oui, je pense que nous allons maintenant faire euh, la prière et je souhaiterais recommander à Dieu tous ces moments bénis, ces moments de grande bénédiction. Et nous sommes très fiers pour euh, tout ce qui a été fait jusque-là. Les panélistes ont vraiment été à la hauteur et le modérateur a été à la hauteur. C'était vraiment, comme on dit en anglais, « wonderful ». Alors à présent, je souhaiterais mettre ceci dans la prière et prier le Seigneur pour qu'il bénisse tout ce qui a été fait jusque-là. Très cher et tendre Père Céleste, je te rends grâce. Je bénis ton Saint Nom de ce que tu nous as véritablement assisté pendant ces moments merveilleux d'échange dans le mariage civil et le mariage coutumier. Nous avons été bénis, nous avons été enrichis 
par tout ce qui nous a été dit ce matin. Or, d'aller bénir richement les panélistes, d'aller bénir également, Père bien-aimé, tous ceux qui ont assisté à cette belle conférence de ce matin. Je prie que tu bénisses également les offrandes et que chacun de nous puissions apporter ce qui est nécessaire quant à l'avancement de l'œuvre du royaume. Nous sommes reconnaissants pour le convenant et nous prions pour lui afin que Dieu, tu lui accordes une longue vie. Merci pour la vision de Global Business Roundtable. Merci pour la vision de Global Fund for Jesus. Merci pour tout ce qui a été fait. À toi l'honneur, à toi la gloire. Merci pour les fonds. Merci pour les donateurs. Remplis l'aide de ton esprit et de ta gloire alors que nous t'avons prié dans le parfait nom de Jésus-Christ. Amen. Amen. To God be the glory. Thank you very much, Your Excellencies. Maybe let me also take advantage to thank uh, His Excellency Chaban Kosi. Uh, we didn't get the opportunity to thank yourself, so thank you so much. Excellencies, may the Almighty God bless you as you go in different ways. But I'm hoping that the technical team is going to bless us with music as we part. Thank you, Excellencies. Stay blessed. Where's Mahalia? Ladies and gentlemen, Mahalia, come on. You are here. rearranging destiny. Lift your hands, say. I worship. You are here. Touching Worship you, yes we do, God. Worship you, I worship. You are here. We are ancient destiny. Ancient destiny. I worship you. I worship you. We call it.